Well, let's get it going. Yeah, um, I, I'm co-chair of the Staff Pride Network. My name is Jonathan, Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I am really excited to present this event uh, for you for Black History Month. Uh, Staff Pride Network event. Uh, uh, we have uh, a couple of co-hosts as well here, uh, are, uh, Zara and Emily, and uh, I will um, in a moment invite them to uh, introduce themselves, just so that you know about Staff Pride Network. <clears throat> we exist to support uh, LGBT plus staff and students at the University of Edinburgh, um, and we do that with uh, a whole host of volunteers uh, who do all kinds of projects. Uh, and if you would like to see more, you can go to our blogs page, which is linked in the chat. Uh, we have various social media uh, that you can click on, join, subscribe to our YouTube. We've got lots of events on there. Uh, and uh, today's event is being recorded and will be up on our uh, YouTube and our university media player um, uh, very soon. Uh, I'll pass you over to Zara. Hi folks, um, I'm Zara. I am a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and uh, I am the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Rep for the Star Pride Network. Um, I will be co-hosting the event today and I'm really excited to have everyone here to talk about um, Black people's experiences of being LGBT around the world. Um, so we're also co-hosting this event with Erin uh, and Emily Senna is here to uh, tell us a little bit about them. So thank you for, for having me. So my name's Emily Senna. I am a academic at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I have an institutional role now um, where I co-convene our race equality and anti-racist subgroup. Um, but before that, I co-founded and uh, co-led Erin, which is the Edinburgh Race Equality Network. Um, so Erin is a network for staff um, and postgraduate students who are Black, Asian, minority ethnic, but also for allies. Um, we've got about 150 members and we've got three kind of main areas of activity um, around community building. So we have um, social events, but we haven't quite caught up um, with the, the magnitude that the Staff Pride Network manages to, to do social events. So we've still got some somewhere to go. Um, but also social media. Um, we have regular meetings. Um, second thing we're committed to is institutional change. Um, so there's different activities in that space. We've got a tackling Islamophobia group. We have a series called the Lunchtime Biography Series where colleagues of colour um, share their, their stories. Um, we also have the Erin Book Club that's open not just to University of Edinburgh colleagues, but also to anyone interested in, in learning and talking and having conversations about race. Um, and then we have some activities around activism. Um, so I'm very, very happy to have been included here today. Um, I also want to do a quick plug for two other affiliate networks in the university, the Staff BAME Network. Um, which is a network for, for BAME colleagues um, and the Women of Colour Collective as well, which is what it says on the tip. So thank you. Um, before we get started as well, I just would like to um, kindly request that instead of paying for a ticket to attend this event, if you are able, um, if you could please send a donation to the charity uh, Sahelia. This is a, um, an Edinburgh and Glasgow based charity which specializes in a mental health and well-being support organization for black minority ethnic, asylum seeker, refugee and migrant women and girls. Um, they offer a wide range of services and projects including uh, counseling and therapies, um, practical and emotional support, they do outreach work, um, they work with young people and they have uh, kind of community gardening and environmental projects. 
Um, and they all work with the goal to promote mental well-being by combating the effects of discrimination and abuse, uh, reducing the stigma of mental health and improving access to mainstream services. Um, so they're a really fantastic local charity and um, we're really pleased to be working with them. So uh, we've put a donation link in the chat. Um, so if you could uh, send a few pounds their way, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so with that being said, um, I think it's time to introduce all of our fabulous speakers. So um, I might let them introduce themselves actually, since they all have uh, many and varied interesting things to say. So uh, we could start with um, Char. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, yay, I got my photo. <laughs> yay. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Char. Um, I'm joining you guys today from Tokyo. Um, but I am originally from the Caribbean. Um, I am a pansexual woman, so my pronouns are she, her, and I, I've been slowly um, talking more and more about um, just being a pansexual woman and my experiences and how um, I walk through life, um, not only as a pansexual woman, but as a Black pansexual woman from the Caribbean, from a culture that does not understand any of that. So um, I'm really excited to be here tonight, today, and I am an artist. So um, the artwork that you see is my work, um, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to everyone and share my experiences. So thank you for having me, and I'm excited for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Char. Um, next, we have uh, Paul Mark, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Paul Mark Francois, and it's okay if you just call me Paul Mark or Archangel Paul Mark. Um, I am a two-spirit, um, Black, uh, born male, and uh, I work in the spiritual realm. So I do a lot of channeling, I do readings, I do healing work. I'm a triple Reiki master. Um, my business is PMQ Spirit Works. Um, I also make crowns. So it's just like the one I'm wearing right now. I have several different ones um, because I think everyone should wear a crown at some point in time. Um, it's very empowering too. Uh, thank you, Georgia. And um, I, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to, uh, I'm very sex positive. And at one point in time, I was planning to become a nun, but um, I was told that I couldn't be a nun because I had a penis. And I thought, how rude. So, <laughs> and I was 10 when that happened. And so um, a lot of the spaces I've been in, it's, um, it, it's been interesting because I, generally tend to be the only person with a penis in a group of girls. And, um, and it's, it's like getting people to understand that, yes, I'm one of the girls, but I just happen to have the bonus of being a boy. So um, that is wh where I walk. And, you know, spiritually, it's, it's, it is historical that, uh, you know, especially with the two spirits, it's historical that we were the um, spiritual leaders of the tribes. And so the fact that we can walk in both spaces, and uh, I, I think that that is coming full circle. It's, it's becoming more honored again. So uh, that would be great. And um, I answer to all the pronouns because um, you know I am who I am. As long as you're speaking the pro pronouns in love, then, uh, you know, there's two of us in here, so you'll be talking to one of us. <laughs> and um, I am so happy to be here. I do a lot of rooms on Clubhouse, and um, I talk about everything from uh, sex to self-acceptance 
to empath uh, mentoring, to psychedelics, um, to sexuality, you know, um, everything. So I'm, I, I've got my finger on the pulse of many things. I almost said my finger in many pots, but that just <laughs> didn't sound right. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it's really fantastic um, to have this opportunity to share. And it's interesting being in America because I was raised in Texas, born in Chicago, raised in uh, Arlington, Texas, which is in the heart of the DFW Metroplex, Dallas-Fort Worth. And it's really interesting how here um, there are concessions made for the ethnicity and then uh, concessions made for the born set, but there aren't many for those of us that are diverse. So we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm Paul Mark and I'm very green. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul Mark. Um, <laughs> finally, we have uh, B speaking as well. So if you'd like to introduce yourself. With pleasure. It is such a delight to be here with all of these wonderful people all across the world with so many varying perspectives. But um, my name is Billy O'Brien, commonly known as B. I am the founder and president of my country's first LGBTQIA plus nonprofit organization known as Colors Caribbean, formerly Colors Came In. Um, I am so many things rolled up into one. I am transgender, pansexual, polyamorous, genderqueer. Um, I'm pretty sure I said my pronouns are she, her, but I'll say them again. And um, yeah, I've been in this line of work for six years now. Um, what else can I say? Yeah, and I, I, I do things like run educational workshops, um, talking about gender and sexuality, and talking about mental health. I've done those at the local library, I've taken them to the schools, universities, to government, to workplaces. Um, I've been championing for marriage equality in my, not just in my country, but across the region as well. The big story happening about that right now, we'll touch on that later on. Um, and uh, as far as, as far as how I identify racially, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a mixed bag. <laughs> I don't really consider myself black. I consider myself more brown than black. Um, I won't give you like a, all the graphy details of my family history, but I've got some Indian, I've got some Jamaican, I've got some Canadian, I've got some Black, got some British. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's English or Irish or something in there. Um, yeah, so I'm a mixed bag, like I said. Um, so I'm a bit of an, an anomaly back home. <laughs> People don't really know what to make of me most of the time when it comes to my gender or sexuality or my race or ethnicity even. Uh, so I do find that I'm, never really quite fit in anywhere, still seems to be the case, but I try my best, you know. Luckily, I've got people like Paul Mark and Char to talk to and engage with, usually by Clubhouse. This is my first time seeing at least Paul Mark on video. <laughs> light for me. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this, what is definitely going to be some interesting conversation. Um, my name is B, and I'm done speaking. Clubhouse etiquette. <laughs> right, you can tell we're so used to clubhouse <laughs> etiquette. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. Yeah, it's, uh, I agree. Uh, we've seen, we've chatted so much in clubhouse. Uh, it's really great to uh, see, see you, hear from you, uh, just and, and together and introduce yourself, introduce you to uh, friends uh, of mine outside clubhouse. Uh, uh, <laughs> and share you with uh, so many amazing other people who are uh, listening, uh, listening today. Um, I, I wanted to, we sort of touched on identities and uh, backgrounds, and I just wanted to uh, sort of highlight how you're from, uh, with you being from different countries, uh, and for our audience, uh, just to let you know that it's currently just at 10.20 in the morning for Paul Mark. Uh, B is in uh, somewhere in the Republic of Ireland, I think near Limerick. Uh, yeah, uh, so at our current time, 
uh, and being in Tokyo, it's just that it's 20 past midnight uh, for Char. So uh, I'm really grateful for you all uh, joining us uh, at, in a, at a time that we've been able to work uh, together. Um, but with living in various cities and countries around the world, um, what would uh, tell us about your experiences growing up, uh, working out your LGBTQIA2 plus uh, identities and how you compare those uh, to elsewhere? Um, who would like to go first? Are we doing PTR order, Jonathan, or is this just <laughs> <laughs> popcorn style, as, as you say. Popcorn, popcorn style. style, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, if I can help. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you look to see who unmutes themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Clubhouse style. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm going to, I think I'll go last because my situation, like I said, I'm already an, a bit of an anomaly, but so is my country. It's it's a little weird. So. Well, I can start. Yeah. Um, it's been really interesting um, being born to older parents and being in the Black community here in America and uh, the inner city. Um, you know, originally I was I, I was born in Chicago, and um, Little Paul Mark uh, de decided that um, I, I experienced my first snowstorm and I was like, oh, this will never do. And so, <laughs> so I was like, we need to go someplace. And my brother, who was 24 years old, uh, older than me, um, and uh, he was going to school at SMU. And so that's how we ended up coming down to Texas, you know. The, the family ended up migrating down to Texas. And then I was like, this is where I need to be. But it's interesting that uh, growing up, it was, my mother was very open. And, um, you know, my birds and the bees was very open-ended. You know, it was like, when, uh, when I asked her where babies came from, she gave me the biological stuff. And then I, you know, when I asked her, like, what was sex? She's like, well, when two people. And she said that, that she knew from early on that I was probably, you know, somewhere in the middle, you know? And uh, she, she had me tested and it was just like, and uh, I, I remember her talking about the, um, the psychiatrist that she took me to. And, um, and it was like, well, he knows he's a boy, but he tests almost evenly as a boy and a girl. <laughs> and it was like, okay. And I remember my sisters asked me um, if, it, if, if I wanted to be a girl. And then I remember I was like, I was like mm, seven or eight-ish. And um, I, I remember this, we, we were in my parents' bedroom and I was wearing shorty pajamas and I looked down and I thought about it. And I was like, nah, you know? <laughs> but I, I think at some point in time, I actually thought that, that my penis would become detachable and I could just pull it out whenever I needed it. You know? <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to get rid of it. I just didn't want to have to carry it all the time. You know? <laughs> I wish it was that yeah. Like yeah, and I was like, if, if, if this could just be an option, you know, <laughs> nothing permanent, which is so funny because that that kind of is how I am, you know, I want options. And so I, I wanted to be able to, you know, switch back and forth, you know, and uh, that was something that really came out. And so when I actually, it's it's so funny when I actually came out, I came out to my friends before I told my mom. And she was like, well, I figured. And I was like, well, how long have you known? And she's like, since you were two. And I was like, and you never said anything? You know? <laughs> and she's like, well, I wanted you to make up your own mind. And I was like, okay, well, that's, you know, 
it's it's a little bit frustrating, but I understand, you know. And she did the the best that she could. And even when it came to my spiritual gifts, she didn't quite know how to use them, but she knew not to squash them. And so that was, uh, you know, and 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 getting to know more people who have gone through the transition, the coming out process, and all of more different backgrounds. I am so lucky that I had that experience because not many people did. And, um, and it's, it, it's, it has really touched me. And, um, you know, the, the, the crown I'm wearing is my mother's pearls because I inherited them. And I was like, I'm not gonna actually wear a pearl necklace all the time, but I, I transformed them into something that I knew that I would wear. And it's, it's a way of honoring her. And so um, I, I, I do wish that more people would just be open to, um, to keeping their children authentic. You know, you can tell me anything. And my mother was, was known for telling people, there's nothing you could do to make me love you less. And that has really, touched me and I'm carrying that on for her. And so with my business, I'm doing a lot of self-acceptance work and helping other people accept themselves as they are and giving people permission to completely love and accept themselves without any guilt or shame. So um, that's, that's kind of my platform and that's what I've been working on. And I will say that high school was still treacherous because it, it was interesting. I generally went uh, in, in my um, elementary school, I went to private schools. So generally I was the only dark face. So I was the only chocolate chip in the cookie. And anytime we went through um, the history lesson on social studies or black history or slavery, it was like every face would turn and look at me. You know, it's like, how, what's he gonna say, you know? <laughs> and um, American history has that whole big thing on slavery and, you know, and it comes up all the time. And every year it would be like, what can we say? Let's look at Hallmark, you know? <laughs> and, and it's like one of those things that, that because I was also usually one of the tallest in the class, um, you know, it's like, I don't want to say anything that's going to upset him because he'll kick, he'll kick my ass. You know? <laughs> and I really was not that rough, but you know, I was intimidating, you know? <laughs> and um, I, I, I think that when I got into high school and it was a public high school, there were more black people and they were um, looking at me as not not acting like I was black because I was raised around white people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't doing all the typical black things, you know? And then of course, with me being gay, then there was something for them to pick on. So I was, at that time, I thought I was just gay. I didn't realize that I was just a, a female spirit in a male body, you know? But, um, coming out and being able to be all of that. And I think um, it, it, it took a lot. It took a lot of courage to get up every morning and go into that cesspool. But I had friends that supported me. And so, um, and, and my, my mom was really supportive. It's like, if I had a hard day, I would call her at lunch and be like, I need the afternoon off. You know? <laughs> And she's like, I'll call you in, you know? <laughs> so it was, it, it was really, it, it was a great experience. And overall, when I look at it, I came out early and I see a lot of people who are waiting until like way late in life, you know, the forties, the fifties, some, sometimes the sixties to come out. And I'm like, wow. So um, yeah, that's a bit of my story. 
I'm oh, so going to steal the only chocolate chip in the cookie. I love that. Yeah. that <laughs> it's like it it really feels like that though. You know, it's like it, it the only dark face. I, I I went to a school where there were only two black students and, and it was like all it's from kindergarten to eighth grade. And there were only two of us. Mm -hmm. It's the same as being a black academic in an institution like the University of Edinburgh. They are yeah. <laughs> very, very, very few of us. So yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I can, I can empathize a lot. Yes. I'm Paul Mark. We, uh, we don't have uh, many uh, Native Americans here and that's, and Two Spirit is, tends to be uh, a Native American uh, identity, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's uh, US or Canadian. Um, I would you like to just uh, briefly explain uh, a little bit about what that is? Um, so two spirit is the third gender. So there would be, um, and and it's it's any of it's all the L, the G, the Bs, you know, and and the Ts, you know, it's that catch all. And generally the two spirit were uh, re revered because with Native American culture, there were dances that were warrior dances or dances that were harvest dances. And so uh, the dances were very gendered, but the fact that you were two spirit meant you could be in both spaces. And so that is the essence of the two spirit one who walks in both spaces. And so that's, it, it's, it's not necessarily the um, disassociative, I've got two personalities, although I do, but, <laughs> but it is the idea that you can walk in both spaces. And so um, the, the idea that you are a, you know, um, a, an animal that can be in both realms. And uh, that is the, the interesting thing. And so I've honored that. And knowing that my spiritual gifts came down from my Native American uh, bloodline. And I was like, okay. So looking in, into that, and I shunned being called a shaman because as far as I was concerned, shaman was a way of life. And I was like, I am not about all of that. You know, um, when, when I decided or when I made peace with the fact that I was not going to become a nun, the idea of going into a religious, um, yeah, a, a, a religious lifestyle just didn't work for me, but I'm fully spiritual. And so the shamanic path was something that like now anybody can call themselves a shaman. But for me, it's really, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's a lifestyle, it's a calling. And although it would be, I, I'm more of a medicine woman, you know, and I'm not taking on the, the shaman. But um, obviously I wear crowns, I'm a princess and I do all the spiritual work. So I'm a medicine woman. Um, I just don't like the label shaman. <laughs> But I did like the group. <laughs> Thanks, Paul Mark. Uh, Char, um, you've uh, talked about uh, Caribbean. You're currently in Tokyo. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about growing up for you and uh, and your identity, gender, yeah. and sexuality, and how that yeah. fits in both um, countries? So my experience is kind of opposite from Paul Marx in that um, I, so in the Caribbean, um, it's a very large uh, black uh, population. It depends on the country where you're from. Um, so my country, I grew up seeing black faces, black people in all, like everywhere, all around me. Um, I'm not even going to joke around and be like, like, this sounds weird to some people, but I honestly, like for a certain part of my life, 
didn't realize that white people existed outside of TV. Like, I just thought, like, I was just like, you see Black people everywhere. You see them as doctors, your teachers, the prime minister, the president, the premier of your country. Um, so everywhere around you, just Black people. So it was a different atmosphere. Um, but the Caribbean is also very religious. Um, and so I grew up in a, a religious home. My father was a preacher. And that means, you know, we were your typical preacher's kids, preacher's wife, preach, preacher's family. And it meant that I heard a lot of negative things about the community from a very early age. And there wasn't any, um, there wasn't any like in my house, um, we did like, uh, we had, what's that word called? I blocked everything about religion. Uh, we, we used to have daily devotions. But my family, my parents never said anything negative about the community or about like anything to do with sexuality. But the general theme in our church was if you are gay, if you're like you identify, if you are a woman and you like women, you're going to help. And so that was um, my experience growing up. Um, and so I started clocking out of church probably like around the age of 13. And I realized very quickly, um, I wouldn't say like I became aware of myself at that age, but I knew that I was different than what my church was telling me that I should be. Um, and I probably started really tapping into who I really was um, when I was 18 or so, I actually went to a, a Christian college as, associated with my church. And so I had to keep any feelings that I had basically under wraps. But that also meant that I wasn't able to explore who I was. And when I left college and like in my 20s, I started exploring that. But then I'm in this country where like they, they you know, my country's not... Um, as dangerous as some other places in the Caribbean, but we've had incidents where they've killed people who are um, a part of the community. And like, I'm not gonna pretend, I like, I am from a certain, like my family name is known where I'm from and people respect our family. They, you know, like, I know I can get a job back home just based on my family's name. And so there was that sense of, I don't want to bring shame to my family. So in a sense, I was protecting them. Um, but and I'm, I'm not going to be too long. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, one of the reasons why I left home is because I realized that even though my family, um, they're very supportive, I just didn't feel like they would support me. And there's things that happened just before I left that left a really sad feeling within me because I, I've seen some stuff that certain family members have done that's um, hatred towards this community and that means hatred towards myself. I, I, my, some people in my family know that I, like, I'm pansexual and they're totally cool with that. So I don't want anyone to be like, oh my gosh. But there are certain family members that I just know they don't respect how I see myself, how, who, the, the people that I choose to support, they don't respect this community. They don't respect any of the letters at all. And so I'm just like, I don't wanna share that with people. Um, I do feel like religion has a lot to do with that. So that's me, I, um, I still love my country. I still love my family. I still love my people. I love the Caribbean in general. I'm gonna be like waving every flag Anytime I see Caribbean people, I'm like, ah, oh, that's my, that's my people. But in the same breath, I know that there's certain parts of me that I cannot share. Um, and it's sad, but that's my reality. And I'm done speaking. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you for sharing. Go on, B, have you, have you, are you okay now? You wanted to go last. Yeah. Oh. I mean, that's a lot to digest from Paul, Mark, and Char. Thank you both for sharing um, your intimate, you know, personal history. 
I'm wondering where to start with in mind. I, okay, I want to give some, I'm going to lay some groundwork first because I'll, I will be kicking myself later if I don't say this now. Um, so since this talk is about, you know, Black History Month and racism and everything that goes along with that, um, what, what seems to be a little known fact is that the slave trade, this transatlantic slave trade uh, that went on for some 150 years, centuries ago, um, the majority of the slaves that were taken from Africa and later on India went to the Caribbean and to Brazil. It was only a small percentage that wound up in North America. It was some, I think it was around 95% went to the Caribbean and, and Brazil. Um, so the truth is where we come from, me and Jar, um, we, you know, our nations, our culture, our people were far more affected by slavery and uh, racism and everything that goes along with it, like I said, um, than the US was. And not to play the Pan Olympics or anything, but it's just, it, I, think, I think it's a little bit disproportionate the kind of attention that the US gets or even other areas in the world. Um, whereas <laughs> jurisdictions around the Caribbean seem to just sidestep that issue entirely. We kind of think like, oh, that's not a thing that happens out in the Caribbean. <laughs> But it's very much, it's very much evident to this day, which is why I'm going to lead into, well, I'm going to lead into my story now. Uh, so, I'm, like I said, I'm from the Cayman Islands, and to those unfamiliar, oh well. If you are familiar with Cayman, you're probably familiar with us being this uh, tax haven <laughs> for the wealthy, and that's very much true. Um, but I'll leave that alone for now. <laughs> but it's also like the New York, the New York City of the Caribbean. It's very much a melting pot. We have people from all over the world. I think there's, last time I checked, I think there's actually, the population is less than half Caymanian now. We've got like Filipino, we've got Jamaican, we've got um, uh, people from Honduras, a lot of Americans, a lot of English, a lot of South African. So yeah, so we're all mixed up. But, but also it seems to be that, I'm sure this is the case. Um, those who were not people of color, those who were not natively Caribbean, Black, Indian, or of Indian descent like me, they hold most of the wealth and therefore most of the power. They might not have a big presence in government because that's still relegated to actual Caymanians for the most part, um, but they still have the bulk of the wealth. Uh, so, so growing up, I went to a Roman Catholic school I was one of the privileged kids, I guess. My, but my parents worked hard to get me there. They they grew up in poverty, like serious poverty, but they worked their asses off to get me into a decent school. Um, but like half of the students there were not from the Caribbean. They were American, they were English or just, um, from Ireland or something all over. So I did have a bit of a worldly perspective growing up. Um, and like I said, you know, we don't really talk to this day. We don't really talk about racism in the Caribbean as a whole, um, much less in, in the Cayman Islands. So it's like you don't really you don't really look out for it um, living there. But when you do stop to pay attention, you realize just how obvious it is. It's not like people going around calling well, calling people of color the N word or doing um. What's it called now? I can't believe hate crimes against people of color. Although we don't really have any hate crime legislation anyway. <laughs> but uh, um, I'm, I'm slowly, slowly leading up to my personal story here. I'm just giving you some context. Um, all of that being said, kind of similar to what Char touched on earlier, um, we, we have this mindset, and we had this mindset since I was growing up, that a lot of what a lot of what's related to LGBTQIA plus anything was always seen as something that's foreign. Even racism was seen as something that's foreign. That doesn't happen in Cayman, that happened over there in the States or in the UK, not some line in business. <laughs> so we didn't really concern ourselves with that. Like even myself, I didn't think I was queer anything until I was late in my teens. And anytime someone tried to associate me with something like that, I would get really defensive about it. I was, 
I was harboring a lot of internalized transphobia, homophobia, et cetera. I didn't even know what trans meant at the time, you know? <laughs> um, I didn't even know transgender was really a thing until I was in my early twenties. That's how disconnected we were from all of this and still are, you know, in spite of all the work I've been doing for years over there. Um, we have yet to even broach the topic of trans anything because we're still talking about marriage equality. We're still talking about gay marriage as if that's the be all and end all of LGBT anything. Um, so it's been interesting for me, right? <laughs> Uh, a, a lot of the stuff I'm kind of just learning uh, as well in the past 10 to 15 years. So it's kind of relatively new to me as well. And here I am trying to educate um, multiple generations from multiple backgrounds with multiple viewpoints. Um, I also want to add one more thing before I <laughs> end my tirade here. I was talking about how these have all these topics and issues are seen as something that's foreign, something that's brought to the islands. Obviously that's not the case, but what has been brought to our islands, and I don't just mean Cayman, but I mean a lot of the Caribbean and Latin America as a whole, are these conservative, closed-minded, cis-heteronormative values, if you wouldn't call them that. Um, but what's funny to me, and I've, I've, I've talked about this ad nauseum at this point, um, is that so many like diehard Caribbean people hold so fast to those kind of viewpoints as if they're, as if they've always been around, as if that's like inherent to our culture, not realizing that this is what was brought from, uh, from Spain, from England, from France and wherever else across, uh, you know, the, um, from the European colonists. Like these are the ideals that were imported you talking about how uh, gays and lesbians and trans people will be going to hell, that they're, uh, they live some sinful lifestyle. These are the imported ideals and no one seems to connect those dots for some reason. Uh, so I'm constantly trying to teach people that history. And again, like I was saying from the very beginning, this all starts with the transatlantic slave trade, you know, which was, which Caribbean and Latin America, which wasn't known as Latin America at the time, but was most impacted by, and is still, I would argue, still impacted by to this day. Um, I mean, like I was saying, even my own native Caymanians, we are now the minority in our own country. So that's why I said it's um, an interesting situation. Last thing, I forgot to mention this as well. The Cayman Islands is a British overseas territory. We, we're not independent. There are a lot of um, British, I think there's about six of them, British overseas territories around the Caribbean. Um, some of them also uh, still still under under uh, Spanish rule or French rule as well. So we're still we're still we still have these colonial ties, um, and a lot of jurisdictions, including my own, don't seem to know how to <laughs> navigate navigate all of that. Um, yeah, so a, a little less personal from my side, but I think you can kind of grasp what what it might have been like for me growing up. I mean, I'm sidestepping a lot of things like me coming out as trans and realizing that I'm pansexual, but that's a whole other, whole other book to read. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Those are such fantastic stories. Thank you everyone for sharing and for being so open and honest. It's so interesting to hear about all of your your vastly different experiences kind of in your countries or in your families or growing up. Um, since we have about 10 minutes left, um, I'd like to invite uh, our audience members, if they have any questions, to use the Q&A button to um, ask any of our speakers about anything you're interested in. Um, we'll give that a second, but if no one, we've got no questions so far. So, um, I'll ask a very quick one, if, if we can keep our answers quite brief. Um, something I think to end on a slightly optimistic note, um, I'd be really interested to know about whether there are any ways that you kind of celebrate your, your Black and your queer, your LGBT, your two-spirit identities, whether there's community spaces, whether there's things you do to kind of celebrate all of those intersections in your identities. Um, 
I do have a hard out in 10 minutes, so can I, can I go first? <laughs> Uh, I have another event to, to jump into. Um, yeah. Well, for my part, um, our organization has been doing these social events for years now. I'm not in Cayman right now, obviously, but um, we would organize weekly meetups. Um, I would do like game nights in my place. We do, we go out to the club sometimes. We were promoting some rainbow club events for a while too. Uh, we've done karaoke, we've done beach days. I'm, I'm now organizing events for our colors Sorry, my organization is Colors Caribbean, but we have a youth program who, uh, which I've been organizing events for as well, like movie nights, game nights, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think my, well, my, my personal motto as well as one for my organization is visibly strong because I believe in leading by example. I believe in coming out and being seen because that's the first step. In, in establishing a community and one that people are have no choice but to identify and no choice but to acknowledge is to come out and be seen, be visibly strong because it does take strength to be seen, um, which is why th that, which, is, which is how the organization started anyway, was encouraging people to come out and um, get together and foster that community. So yeah, I've been doing that for well over half a decade now. Um, I'm going to jump in, I guess, um, the biggest thing that I've been doing recently actually is clubhouse. Um, so the clubhouse room that I, um, B and Paul Mark and Jonathan, um, and like we all frequent that room that really helped me, um, these past few months, um, just hearing different perspectives, different views, um, meeting people from the community from around the world has been really helpful. Um, it's kind of been like in Japan. I mean, we're in a pandemic, so there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to really grow. Um, so this has been, or that has been very helpful for myself, but also I would say doing i low-key do artwork for um different people that i know within the community so if they're like hey i need a poster or something i feel like that's my little way of um tapping in and giving back and just sharing art and sharing love um and i guess also in a way like i know there's a few there i, I work with kids um, I've had kids like come up to me and I feel like they think that um, having a conversation, I'm able to listen and mentor in a way. So that's been my little me giving back, growing within the space. Yeah. So Bye. I'll quickly say that I... My, my whole business is about self-acceptance and self-empowerment. And so I am uh, being that space for everyone. And it's not, um, you know, one of the things is that, uh, you know, in America, we had separate but equal and separate is never equal. And so I'm creating a space for everyone to accept who they are. And it starts with the self. So I'm, I'm doing it one person at a time, sometimes 10 people at a time, but uh, you know, I'm allowing people to uh, work through their own stuff. And that means that when I have one friend that says something racist or problematic, then I can talk to them, not publicly, privately, and say, you know, this is, this is not great and this is why, you know? But again, it's like, I, I don't want to start with this is wrong because then you're, uh, you're making them become defenseless, you know, or defensive, you know, it's like, it's like they have to defend what they said. And so it's like, why did you say that? And what's in that space? And so I'm having those conversations. 
And that is how I'm doing my part to make the world a little bit better. Mm. Thank you, Paul Mark. Um, I'm gonna jump in and answer a question from Nigel before I have to go. Um, although I'm still, I'm still staring over that. Uh, do you think the Cayman Islands deserves a census slash survey for the sake of cataloging ethnic LGBT plus concerns? Um, I think, I absolutely think we deserve one. We should have one, so, something like that. I've been fighting to at least include like gender identity and sexual orientation in the census for a while now, but that's still not come to fruition. So I think that's maybe a few steps, a few steps ahead of where we are right now, where we, um, where we the, uh, the bridges we need to cross first. Um, like I was saying earlier, we haven't even talked about pretty much any of the issues affecting me personally as a trans person, as a pansexual person, as a polyamorous person, we're still stuck on marriage equality. And that's a, you know, a major issue, but um, it's just scratching the surface. Uh, so yeah, I would love to attempt something like that if, if we had the kind of resources and um, I don't know, cultural readiness to embrace that sort of thing. Yeah, but uh, for all the progress that uh, came out as made as a whole, we're still so far behind in terms of tackling these issues, as is most of, most of the Caribbean anyway. Um, we've also had several questions um, in the Q&A about whether there's anything we can do to kind of help address or inform Caribbean culture um, to kind of promote tolerance and difference in those communities. So I wonder if Bea could touch upon that before she has to rush off. Sorry, um, do what with the Caribbean culture? Um, so whether uh, there's a way to kind of um, inform uh, people to, of like LGBT issues and whether they there's a way that we from abroad can kind of help promote. Oh, cool. Yeah, probably the easiest and quickest thing you can do is to seek out those activists working so hard in these areas and their organizations or their groups or collectives. I know so many of them, but so I can't, I can't rattle them all off right now, but they're not hard to find. But as much as I love them, they're not so good with the marketing stuff. <laughs> um, so you, kind of, you, you, do, you do have to go looking for them. They, they're not so good at making themselves known. But yeah, they've been, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm getting a little choked up because we just lost uh, an act. I just heard this like a few hours ago. We just lost a fellow trans activist from Trinidad who was part of one of the collectives I'm part of as well, um, Brandy Rodriguez. So that's that's sad to hear. But this work isn't easy. You know, in general, it's not easy, but especially in the Caribbean uh, and Latin America where it's, uh, I guess, depending on the metrics you use, but it's one of the most dangerous places in the world to be queer. Um, so yeah, uh, find them on Facebook, find them on Twitter, find them on Instagram, and just follow them. Give them some visibility, visibly strong. You know, visibility really, really matters, and it really helps a lot. Um, it helps to bolster their efforts and and you know just give them a signal boost because they could really use that. And attend their events, do the Zoom meetings, even if it's just like something you pop on while you're washing the dishes. Just show up. Just showing up goes a long way. That's a really great answer. Thank you, B. And we're really sorry to hear about your friend. Um, all of our condolences. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry to hear that, B. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, my, my condolences, B. Um, I wanted to jump in really quick and answer Nigel's question to me. Um, so, Sorry, I'll Paul Mark, take... just before you do that, B's going to have sure. to leave in like uh, within <laughs> one minute. So I just wanted to thank B for coming. Uh, if anyone wants to fill out a feedback form and put anything, uh, any messages to uh, B or our panelists, we'll pass those on. Um, I'm certainly happy to stay uh, a little bit longer. Uh, I, I feel like Paul Mark would be happy to share a little bit more. Uh, and answer that question at least, but uh, I just wanted to make sure I said that before B left. Oh, Thank you. yes. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks B. Love you.
Thank you, B. Thank you so much for speaking, B, and sharing your story. Um, Thank you as well. This has been fantastic. Uh, keep up the phenomenal, phenomenal work, all of you, especially Paul, Mark, and Char. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to go join this other trans collective. So, oh. okay. Stay visibly stressed. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, okay. So, answering Nigel's question, which was, how did I cope in high school? And I will say that one of the ways I coped was I had some really scary friends. Uh, the, the funny thing about it was being, being unnecessarily uh, or uncategorizable. I was able to uh, align myself. So I was the extra in every group. I was, um, you know, I was friends with somebody from every single uh, clique. And so I was allowed in the clique, even though I was not, I've never been much of a joiner, but I was um, allowed in with a lot of different people. And for those people who were, um, you know, anti Palmark for whatever reason, and generally it was the black kids that were, you know, against me for being gay. Nobody else had any kind of issues with me. And so uh, the idea was get in where you fit in. And so I had some people who were, who others were scared of that, took me under their wing. And so, um, you know, they were upperclassmen, they were, uh, you know, formidable and people who uh, folks were a little bit scared of. And I enjoyed that because I didn't have to be the scary one. I didn't have to fight my own battles. And, uh, and that was really, you know, an excellent thing. And like I said, my story has been a lucky one because I've always been able to find a person, you know, um, who would put me in a place of power, not as the president of the club, but definitely as an officer. And I was usually like, you know, third in charge. You know, if I wasn't president, I was vice president or treasurer somewhere where I had a position of power that that commanded respect. And uh, that has followed me all through my life. And uh, it was interesting because starting my own business, it was a little scary for me to get out there and be like, okay, I've done all the decision-making for somebody else that was a masthead. But for me to actually be the masthead was a different thing, you know, it's like, the buck really stops with me, you know? Um, and so I had to, to do that work to get out, you know, and have my own business and be my own boss. But otherwise, it's been really great that I've, you know, aligned myself with people who didn't, you know, who got to, to be likable. And I used to always say, they don't have to like me, but they must respect me. And that has been one of the biggest things, you know, and uh, what's interesting is those people who were, you know, the presidents or the leaders that their power relied on uh, likability. I was one of those that I was put in a place of power because I did what other people didn't want to do. And so I was able to say, well, I can make a hard decision. And um, I was talking to uh, my fraternity sister just the other day. And she, she was like, you've always been a great idea person. And I was like, well, yeah, because, and, and she, she said that even way back in, in college, when, um, when the, we were having an officer's meeting and it was like, we need to figure out a fundraiser. And I was like, well, I'm really busy. So I'll give you an idea, but you guys have to make it happen. 
And so that's what, what I have been. And I'm, I'm, I'm here at a psychedelic conference and uh, my friend Cole is uh, the, the, the masthead behind that. And she does all the work and spending time with her because I met her on Clubhouse. And so this is my ability, you know, my first time to actually be in her space physically. And it's interesting that the more I spend time with her, I'm like, you and I share a brain because there's so much stuff that she says. And it's like, oh my gosh, that is me. And she's, you know, and it's like, it's one of those things where if we have to do it, we'll do the legwork, but we'd really rather just have the brilliant idea and have somebody else fill it in. And so, um, and then we can just move on to the next brilliant idea. And, um, but yeah, so because I was the brilliant idea person, I had a lot of people who were, you know, the leader or the muscle. And I was able to just be the idea person. So, nothing ever I, I was I was never the one that you know had blood on their hands or, or what what have you but I had other people that protected me you know and so if there was anybody who wanted to give me trouble or give me grief there were people around me who were like don't mess with Paul Mark because if you have a problem with Paul Mark you have a problem with me and so, um, yeah, that is, that's how I got through it. And it was interesting because I had a transition when I became the senior and my upperclassmen had graduated. It was like, oh, okay. But then I had other people who were below me who were looking up to me. So that's when I was like, okay, well, I can do this, you know? Um, and I know that not everybody has that, you know, it's like people ask, how did you get to that place of accepting yourself and that place of, I don't give a crap what somebody else is thinking. And it was because I had to go to that place. That had to be where I came from. And um, yeah. I'm empowering other people now to get to that place. You don't have to be afraid. You can just suck it up and move forward. And the worst anyone, the worst thing that anyone can say to you is no. And once you get past that, everything else is kind of a breeze. You can make a request. You can say, please like me please follow me, whatever. And the worst that anyone can say is no. So once you learn how to receive a no, you're fine. And I'm very green. <laughs> have some cheerleaders for that, please. That's such a lovely answer. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, just before we all rush off, I think, um, Emily had a question as well. Um, I did. I, I, I had a quick question, but I need to leave a quarter past. So if I run away before you finish to answer it, don't think that I've been offended by your answer or anything. Um, so I was just thinking about um, what you've all described, especially about traveling. And then, you know, this event obviously is about the intersections of um being black and part of um the lgbt plus community and then i was thinking about so myself when i so i lived in australia for a while and obviously i'm black and i'm british and in the uk i'm very black but in australia it was my britishness that far overrode the color of my skin in terms of how people interacted with me and i just wondered um with your experience both of you with your experiences and especially being in different contexts, are there different settings in which, you know, different aspects of your identity override others? Um, yeah, so like, um, I, my, uh, the, a lot of things that Billy was saying, B was saying, um, ring true for myself as well. So I am, um, 
my country is a British overseas territory. So technically I'm British, <laughs> but um, so I used to live in the UK for a bit. And I don't think anyone saw me even as like, I was a black woman. Um, I was a queer woman, but then as soon as I opened my mouth, everyone automatically thought that I was an American woman. Um, and so that they just went with that. I was always in any space, the American person. And I was like, no, I'm not. And so that part of my identity, like everything was, anything that had to do with being American just got thrown on me. Um, and then even over here, it's very interesting living in Japan because <laughs> there's like Japanese and then it's everyone else, <laughs> foreigner. <laughs> But then you're a black foreigner. So it's like either you're scary foreigner and you're just like this negative bundle of negative, whatever. Like they, any stereotype from the media about black people is you walk into a room and you know, like you have this, you, every black person at one point in their lives, they've had that experience where people clutch their purses a little bit well over here people will literally jump <laughs> like someone will jump <laughs> and I'll just be walking past and I'll laugh at them and you can see this look on their face is like oh my gosh this person's laughing I'm like yeah I'm laughing because that was a stupid reaction I don't care about what you're doing I'm trying to get to the train station so there's like I have like my keychain has a rainbow on it and I can see sometimes like my co-workers will look at it and then they'll look at me then they'll look at it again and it's like can she also be a, like can she be more than just the scary black woman can she also now be now she's a foreigner because remember there's Japanese and then there's everything else is foreigner then there's the scary black woman or you're either like if you're not scary then you're like this curiosity you're this I've never seen this type of person before. Oh my gosh. It's like a newness. She has black skin. So it's either that. And then it's like, wow, could she also be something else that I don't understand? I'm so curious about this. So yeah, I've had times where I'm just like, I would like to be seen as a complete whole being, my, like my full self but I also don't care. <laughs> like um, these things don't bother me. Um, being, not being seen for my full self. And it's, it's sad. It is very sad that it doesn't bother me. And it's mostly because I'm just like, I know as a black woman, no matter where I go, that <clears throat> my blackness is going to shape how people view me. And then also I know the the issue of me being like being from the Caribbean but then having a British passport but then sounding like I'm an American that's a confusion in its own right there and then I a lot of people just look at me and they think I'm straight and so I don't feel like I have to convince anyone that I'm not straight so I don't care anymore <laughs> I really don't <laughs> I hope that answers the question <laughs> it does thank you thank you I think for me in Australia, the thing that used to frustrate me most was people would forget, almost forget that I was black and then would say racist things that would then make me angry <laughs> about, you oh, know, well, the community or, yeah, that kind of thing. That has happened to me a lot where my, my friends forget I'm black and will say something that's borderline racist. And I'm like, really? Really? We doing that today? Um, but uh, again, it's, it, it's interesting how that has occurred. But when I travel, when I've traveled abroad, the thing that really stands out other than my femininity, because sometimes I'm wearing a dress, you know? Um, actually, I, I, I wear caftans, I don't wear full dresses, but um, you know, sometimes I'm doing that or so, sometimes, I'm accessorized. Sometimes I'm wearing a little bit of lipstick, you know. Um, I don't do full makeup, but I might do lipstick. Um, but what's interesting is 
I, I stand out and I guess because of the green hair or because I wear a crown or whatever, um, it's, it's usually people who are like, look at you, you're just being you. And they admire that portion of it. Um, but I will say that a lot of places, uh, if my femininity isn't what gets them, it's, my, it's the fact that I'm American. And uh, people all over either want money from Americans or think that Americans are assholes. And it's like, it's not the same. You know, it's, it's like, it's, it, it's like, oh, you're an American, you know? And um, I've, I've noticed that. So, um, and it's interesting, like when, when I'm down in, you know, in a Spanish speaking country and I pull out what little bit of Spanish I have, um, they're, they're like, oh, and so then it switches uh, that to you're not American, are you Dominican or are you Haitian? You know, because uh, my last name is Francois. And so in America, pe people think, oh, you're Haitian. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm as American as I can be. And, um, and when, when I'm with Spanish speaking people, people think I'm Dominican. And so it's like, um, I'm okay with that. But my Americanness is what really stands out. And now I'm going to have to dip out because I've got um, people that I'm supposed to be talking to. <laughs> yeah, I think with that, we'll wrap it up. Um, but thank you both so much, uh, Cha and Paul Mark. And uh, thanks again to B, who is not here anymore, but was also fabulous. Um, it's yes. been so, so interesting to hear all about your experiences and all about your, your identities. Um, this has been really lovely. Um, thanks uh, to Jonathan for co-hosting and Emily, who's also just had to dash off uh, for also co-hosting. Yes. Um, and once again, I'd just like to plug um, Sahelia as an amazing local charity uh, working with um, BAME and refugee and migrant women and girls in our local Edinburgh and Glasgow area. Um, so if you could please, please donate to them um, if you've appreciated this event, um, they would also really appreciate that. So um, thank you everyone for coming and um, please leave your feedback as well on the feedback form that should be in the chat and they'll also be, I think, emailed around after this. So um, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.